Hello and welcome back, and that's right, today I want to talk about PCIe Gen 5 M2 NVMe SSDs. It's been a long old road, and many of us assumed that this kind of technology, and certainly this kind of super fast storage, was going to arrive last year in 2022. But everything from hardware shortages, down to the general effects of the pandemic and the post-pandemic workflow world, and all the recovery with that globally, resulted in Gen 5 SSDs certainly taking something of a back step in terms of its release strategy but right now in the first quarter of 2023 we're starting to see not only some gen 5 ssds arriving on the scene but also newer and higher performing promises being made by other ssd brands as their solutions come to market so we at nas compares went ahead and got ourselves a Gen 5 test machine to get ourselves all set up for the Gen 5 generation as we're going to be reviewing more and more SSDs as they start to arrive just like we did with the Gen 4 series indeed if you're watching this as a PS5 gamer, I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts that when a PS5 Pro arrives in the next few years, that's going to be Gen 5 as well. So we're going to be following this technology more and more in the next few years. But this video is going to be talking about that architecture. What improves uh, over the Gen 4 generation? We're also going to talk about the considerations that both manufacturers and consumers need to make. And then we're going to rally through five, maybe six technically, SSDs in the Gen 5 generation that have either just about arrived or are hoping to arrive in the next six months or so. So let's crack on first with Gen 5 considerations. Now this new generation of storage is Gen 5 times 4 in bandwidth there. That means, much like the PCIe generation before it, the, uh, the generation band that it's put in within the PCIe opens up tremendous bandwidth. And that multiplying factor there, the times 4, is what where we get our eventual bandwidth to play with. And not necessarily the performance, but the available bandwidth. So in the case of Gen 4 times 4 in the previous or technically current generation that gives you 8000 megabytes per second for this ssd to try to fill okay so gen 5 times 4 effectively doubles that at 1600 megabytes per second or 16 gigabytes there give or take and again we can talk about mts but ultimately let's stick with the megabytes and gigabytes shall we now Right now, there is no Gen 5 SSD that's been revealed that can fully saturate that. In the same way, Gen 4, the closest it ever got, I think, was 7,400, maybe 7,500 on a good day. Now, the Gen 5 SSDs can kind of fall into two categories. The first revealed devices that are going to be utilizing that E26 controller from Fizon, and there's a new subset arriving with slightly tweaked or improved controllers, particularly one that we're going to talk about later on from Silicon Motion, where they're getting closer to a greater saturation there. But those are SSDs that are going to be coming way, way, way at the end of 2023. So let's reel it in just a little bit there. Now, in terms of that bandwidth, it's being attained, one, by these newer generation of controllers that are taking advantage of uh, NVMe 2.0 compliance. Uh, on top of that, improvements in the NAND with the majority of these Gen 5 SSDs. And the NAND is where the data lives, of course, um, utilizing 232 layer 3D TLC NAND. And that seems to be a universal standard on the majority of SSDs right now. But another thing we need to factor in is heat. Because if you've been following Gen 5 SSDs as they've been revealed at CES for the last couple of years and the you know events in between, you'll see that the bulk of these SSDs are all arriving with pretty aggressive heat sinks on board. And that's because the Gen 5 drives performing that much faster are generating that much more heat. I am pleased to say that it looks like in terms of durability, they are maintaining a 0.38 drive rights per day standard there. So that's not dissimilar to the bulk of SSDs right now from brands such as uh, Sabrent, WD, Samsung, and Seagate as well. Though some of them uh, have been utilizing, at least in the Gen 4 generation, even more durable now to push those heights a little higher. But predominantly across the industry, 0.38 is kind of, as far as drive rights per day goes, pretty much the middle there for the consumer to the prosumer. Now, that heat generation is going to be such a 
big hurdle for a lot of different brands not only because they're going to have to factor the spacing of these drives to factor in these enormous heat sinks that are going to allow heat dissipation from the drive to be presented into there and then freed up into the air to remove it away from that controller but on top of that a lot of these heating systems are going to require power on board simple passive heat sinks almost certainly particularly with the next generation of these kind of drives is just not going to be possible and active cooling systems for these m2 ssds are going to be if not standard then highly recommended so that's where gen 5 is at right now a lot of uh, users would agree that the biggest delay to gen 5 properly landing what you do with shortages in the NAND, that's been kind of a, a affecting everyone from first party to third party NAND utilization. But when it comes to the actual drives arriving, I think the first drives we should talk about are the Fison E26 drives, particularly ones that are either on the cusp of arriving or ones that we've already learned a great deal about. So these are the drives that have either been just recently released or ones that have got the most fleshed out data sheets currently available. The first one, and probably one of the most well known ones right now, is from Gigabyte. And that is the Aurorus or Aurus 10,000, their Gen 5 SSD. Now they've got it reported at performance levels of 10,000 megabytes per second or 10 gig um, uh, sequential read and in sequential write 9,500 there. So again, around about one and a half to 2,000 megabytes per second than some of the Gen 4 SSD in the market there um, that takes advantage of the Fison E26 controller there utilizing 3D TLC NAND there again 232 layer with 2 gig of DDR4 memory with only the 2TB being uh, the drive that's available right now they've not really fleshed out whether it's going to arrive in 1, 2 and 4TB or even touching on that 500 gig of some of the smaller uh, capacities overall um, on top of that it's as I mentioned it's one of the few SSDs that's currently available all of those stock is tremendously low in terms of IOPS it's reported at 1.5 million IOPS um, uh, sorry uh, read IOPS and at right IOPS it's 2 million reported then again that's 4k random pricing for 2TB is knocking around at about 340 to 350 dollars and we've already spotted it on a couple of websites hopefully that's on screen there now as mentioned, this is probably one of the three most recurring scene drives online. But let's move on to one of the other ones that's also kind of appeared available for sale. Now the Inland TD510 is pretty much identical to that of the Gigabyte we just discussed. Once again, uh, 10, um, 10 gig over 9.5 gig performance, 1.5 over 2 mil IOPS there. Even the pricing at 2 TB is largely the same. And that is something we're going to see a lot of in the first wave of Gen 5 SSDs. Not only because a lot of them are using that third party Fison controller anyway, that E26, but the technology right now can only be pushed so far. And because they're utilizing NAND from this company, they're using the controller from this company, and obviously they're providing a lot of their firmware and tweaks in between, and obviously with the application to the PCB, there's only a finite amount of influence they can have over that general architecture. And much like the Gen 4 generation, when it originally arrived with the E16 Faisal controller, and when the E18 controller was pretty much everywhere you're going to see a lot of drives again with that same level of durability at 0.38 the same reported sequential the same reported iops there as firmware updates arrive and tweaks to that controller are made available and particularly depending on the nan distribution and the capacities you will start to see differences between these drives but the inline there is largely identical to that of that gigabyte we just discussed and it is one of the drives that you can buy right now which takes us to a drive that's on the verge of release. And this is from MSI with their Spatium series. They were another one of the brands that was relatively early to the uh, 7K revolution of PCIe Gen 4 SSDs. And they are bringing two versions of their Gen 5 SSD to market. Uh, that is the M570 and the M570 Pro. Now that Pro, for all intent and purposes, 
seems to only be one major difference, and that is that the non-pro version uh, rocks up at 10 gig read, 10 gig write, and the Pro Series has got 12 gig read and 10 gig write. Again, this is the E26 um, controller. It is that 232 layer 3D TLC NAND. It's 1.5 over 2 mil IOPS. It's pretty much everything you expect there. But it is arriving with a particularly aggressive heat sink there that even though it's quite compact, does have onboard active um, fan uh, an, an onboard active fan, which means it's going to require power when it's installed there. Again, pricing is still yet to be fully fleshed out on this, although at CES they did reveal original pricing on that. And I think this is one that's going to arrive, if not by the summer, then maybe even a crossover between spring-summer 2023. Another SSD that looks like it's going to arrive and not a dissimilar time, maybe a fraction after that MSI, is the Patriot SSD there. Now, this has very similar specifications to that of that M570 Pro there. So, once again, the E26 controller, the uh, 232 layer NAND there at 3D TLC. But the one difference is they were actually prepared to detail that they are going to be releasing a 1, 2, and 4TB model there. So, again, quite useful to know where those capacities are going to be when a lot of the brands are kind of focused on very small subsets of capacities and revealing very little. But I would also argue that even if they do release a 4TB, it is not going to be a cheap drive. It's going to be outlandishly expensive. Yes, you probably get the higher performance due to the larger distributing of NAND on the PCB, but it's not going to be a cheap drive, so do bear that in mind. Again, 1.5 over 2 mil IOPS. Uh, it's 12 gig read over 10 gig write, so not fully saturating that Gen 5 times 2 bandwidth there. Very few drives can at the moment, but it should be highlighted that this drive is another one of those floaty in the background ones, and I would still be interested to see how they're going to approach the subject of heat dissipations, because Patriot and their previous drives have always had, frankly, pretty cool heat sinks. I'm going to be interested to see what they do with the Gen 5 drives, you know. Which brings us to the Sabrent Rocket X5. Before we go any further, that name is probably going to change when it reaches eventual release. But unlike a lot of the SSDs we've seen rolled out in the last 12 to 14 months, either at CES or eventual to release, Sabrent, considering their history to try to get to the market before everyone else, they've taken a slightly more tactile approach and have publicized that their drive, the X5, is going to be using that E26 controller. But after that, with reported performance measurements at uh, or their own uh, crystal disk mark there, a one gig test file at 12,398 megabytes per second sequential read and uh, 11,844 megabytes per second sequential write, they're highlighting in quite a lot of detail in different locations that they are trying to hit a certain performance benchmark before they release, which again, when you look at the history of Sabrent as a brand, which has generally tried to get there ahead of most other brands out there, this is a weirdly mature and tactile choice for a brand that for a long time was always considered an outlier, but in the Gen 4 generation with their Rocket 4 Plus series, really exploded into the scene. Again, we've talked about heat sinks for console and PC users from Sabrent, and as a brand, they've really evolved. And whereas Three, four years ago, a lot of users might not have looked at them in the same conversation as Gigabyte, as MSI, as A-Data, as WD, Samsung, and more. Now we're seeing them in the conversation a lot more. And I'm going to be interested to see how both Sabrent and Seagate tackle this subject. Because in previous generation at Gen 4, Sabrent and Seagate were the ones that released a very different drive to everyone else at that time time and whether it was for durability at the seagate side or at sabrent at the performance side at a better price point so again although we don't have a lot of formative information from them and the rocket x5 title may completely change i they're a brand that i'm going to be keeping an eye on for when that particular drive arrives because i think they're going to approach it with a certain nuance that we've seen them do previously And talking about doing things differently, let's talk about 
A data and the XPG Gen 5 drive that at the time of recording doesn't actually have an official name. Now, for those of you that followed the Gen 4 generation, you'll know that they had the X70 or the S70 series in the Gen 4, and it was using a different controller to everyone else at the time. When everyone else was going fires on E18, they were going InnoGrit with the Rainer controller there. And in the Gen 5 generation, we're seeing a similar a tactic here. We're not seeing them go for that FISA on their A data are utilizing, they've not detailed the NAND they're going to be utilizing, which I think is going to be interesting because they are in a position to kind of overstep everyone in terms of the NAND. But it's the controller that I really want to talk about because, as mentioned, they're not going for the FISA on like everybody else. They're going for the Silicon Motion SM2508 controller there and they are highlighting their performance numbers are higher than everyone else not only are the reported IOPS 2 million over 2 million so again half a million more in terms of 4k random read IOPS but in terms of performance they are saying that their drive will hit 14 gigabytes sequential read and sequential write at 12 gigabytes there so again we're seeing numbers certainly higher than every other drive we've talked about today both in terms of read and write and presumably that is possible because of that controller in the same way that the inno grit from the previous generation could outperform the Fison in some select areas it arrived later something we're probably going to see here with the silicon motion but at the same time it's going to be really interesting to see how that impacts the overall performance um, long term a sustained performance the heat dissipation is going to have to be insane and also durability because once again those that followed the previous generation will know that the integrate um, Rainer controller in the gen 4 generation of a data xpg drives had a higher durability at 0 0.5 drive rights per day how much of that was because of the NAND they were utilizing and that Rainer controller I never really got the chance to find out but um, but the XPG drive and that Sprint drive for me are the ones that I'm the most intrigued to follow. But, you know, let's wrap up this video. Before we go, let's talk about the brands that we, for some reason, still aren't talking about. Welcome to the world of tomorrow! Seagate, WD and Samsung. These were the three biggest brands in the consumer and prosumer Gen 4 generation. And all three of these brands had a decent drive available within the first year to 14 months of the full rollout of Gen 4. Now, fast forward to Gen 5, they've all three of them have been weirdly quiet, something I find very unusual. To break down into all three examples, WD and Samsung have been talking about the Gen 5 generation. They have, particularly Samsung more than WD, have been talking about it at the enterprise sector there. But in terms of standard M2 configuration drives, zero in the commercial uh, consumer and prosumer sector. Only really data center and high-end flash. Now with Seagate, Seagate has had an incredibly close relationship with Fison for a very long time in terms of developing their own drives. Indeed, when the Gen 4 generation appeared, they were one of the first on the scene using the E26 controller, and then slowly but surely, everyone overtook them, I say everyone, four or five brands overtook them with a new Fison controller in the E18, and then Samsung uh, sorry, then Seagate jumped over those with the Fire Cuda 530 series afterwards using the E18 controller. And that's something we saw and then everyone else catching up, which is weird when we're in the Gen 5 generation. And I kind of expected Seagate to be on the front line. I expected them to roll out officially with an E26 controller SSD with, you know, 10 over 10, 12 over 10 and higher durability maybe on a Fire Cuda 550 or 540 series. But we're going to have to wait and see how that rolls out. But that's where those three brands are. And which one of those three big players makes the most aggressive move into the gamer sector for this? It's going to be really interesting to see. But I hope you've enjoyed this video while we talk about Gen 5 M2 NVMEs
throughout 2023. Now, maybe I've missed an SSD. Maybe a few months down the line, some new SSDs have arrived and the whole scene has changed. Let me know in the comments whether you watch this in the future or now, and we'll do a follow-up to this. But thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. Let me know in the comments what you guys thought of this and whether we should pursue. And of course, stay tuned for more Gen 5 related SSD reviews, benchmark, and comparisons in 2023. I am sick of lifting up this incredibly heavy PC. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.